Welcome to lecture five of this uh, sixth lecture series on the foundations of deep reinforcement learning. So what have we covered so far in previous lectures? We've looked at what are MDPs and exact solution methods, which apply to small uh, MDPs, but not uh, large ones that we typically want to solve. We looked at deep Q-learning, which can solve larger MDPs. Um, it's an off-policy method, which makes it quite data efficient. It can also introduce instabilities at time, which can be uh, you know, a downside in terms of the amount of tuning involved. But these days, people can get it to work really well on a wide range of problems. We looked at policy gradients, as well as the latest incarnations thereof, uh, as in the form of TRPO and PPO, with PPO probably the most widely used RL algorithm today, which directly optimize a policy. And by directly optimize a policy, they're actually a lot more stable, easier to, to debug, because you're always getting data from the latest best policy, and this keeps monotonically or close to monotonically if it's run well, improving over time. But the downside of these on policy methods is that they tend to be not as sample efficient. Would you care about sample efficiency? Depends on your problem. Some problems, well, all you care about is compute efficiency. And if your data can be collected really quickly because you're running in a very fast simulator, sample efficiency might not be the bottleneck Compute efficiency might be your bottleneck. But if you do care about sample efficiency, then often you might uh, have a preference for the methods we'll see in this lecture here, DDPG and SAC over PPO, because they will reuse the data that's collected from the past more. They'll reuse it more often, so do more gradient updates per data collected, which allows the neural network to extract more information from the data collected and hence learn more from less data very often. And so if you look at learning curves, you often see like horizontal axis sample complexity, vertical axis performance, and you see that often SAC and DDPG will have a very good sample complexity. And so we'll take a look at those now. So we'll start with DDPG, and then we'll go to SAC. At a high level, you can think of SAC as the maximum entropy version of DDPG. In fact, at every level, you can think of it as the maximum entropy version of DDPG. So let's start with DDPG. How does it work? You get rollouts under the current policy, plus maybe some noise to make sure there's exploration if your policy is um, not naturally stochastic or something. Then there's a Q function update. So based on the rollouts, you have estimates of your Q function, and then you do a update on this. We've seen this before, what this could be. This target here could be reward plus gamma times Q at the next state. Or you could use reward at the current transition plus reward at the next plus Q after that. We saw this estimation that there is many variants of to which extent you take the Monte Carlo rollout signal versus the bootstrap signal. In the original DDPG paper, they used the one-step bootstrap signal, but variants have been done since that are often still called DDPG, where you would use uh, multiple steps of rewards followed by the Q function as your target. So we're doing Q learning, but we're doing it based on data collected from the current policy uh, or from a recent policy. And then we update the policy. So in regular Q learning, you just keep track of a Q function, but here we also have a policy and the policy is optimized as follows. You can look at the Q function at each state that we encountered. And then there's an action we can take. This action will be chosen by the policy. We want to optimize the policy such that if we apply the policy at the states where we've collected samples, then the Q function will predict that we'll achieve a high value. So what is this saying? It's saying optimize your policy to shift the weight or shift the actions towards actions that have high Q values. And by the way, unlike the previous policy gradient methods, the uh, you know, standard policy gradient as well as PPO and TRPO, which rely on the likelihood ratio policy gradient, this policy gradient here goes through the Q function. And by going through the Q function here, actually, if you want to, your policy could be a deterministic policy. Of course, for your data collection, you might still want some stochasticity, and that's why it says here maybe plus some noise but you can have a deterministic policy. And that's why it's called deep deterministic policy gradient. It doesn't have to be a deterministic policy, but it can be if you want it to be. 
Okay, and then you repeat. So more rollouts, use the data to further improve your queue function estimate, and then update your policy such that it maximizes queue value at the states in your uh, replay buffer. There are a couple of extra things, if, especially if your policy is deterministic, you wanna add noise to ensure there's exploration. The replay buffer and target network ideas from DQN increase stability. And often people use some lagged or polyac averaging version of Q phi and pi theta for the target values of Q hat. So when you have the target values, you use this, just like in DQN, you use a older version of your Q function to stabilize things so it doesn't like hop, hop around too quickly. Once you do this, you can get actually really nice results. For example, in simulated robotics environments, this is from the original DDPG paper. You see here a reacher, a uh, legged robot, and then the reacher, uh, robot that knocks a ball up. And so, there's a, and this is actually also done from, from pixels. So image inputs able to learn a control policy this way. So, and even a, a racing game was trained this way. So very, very interesting that this is all possible with a policy gradient method, and it'll be more data efficient than a regular policy gradient method. So it's nice, very sample efficient, thanks to off policy updates. The downside of DDPG transition has been that it can be a bit unstable. And that's where soft factor critic has come in and has in many places become the method of choice. It stabilizes things by adding entropy in the objective. So it's gonna be a max ent formulation. And this will ensure better exploration and less overfitting of the policy. Of course, you need to make sure that your entropy doesn't uh, decay too quickly. Otherwise you don't get that exploration, of course. And then the entropy, when I say less overfitting on the policy to any quirks of the Q function, because the Q function favors a specific action in DDPG, my policy might heavily favor that action, but maybe the Q function is still noisy. And maybe by having a max ent in the objective, you'll have a more spread out policy that doesn't you know, seek out to peak so highly on that specific action the Q function currently thinks is best. Okay, so what does it look like? It'll use a soft policy evaluation. So if you look at a Q function, the target will be reward plus expected future rewards summarized in the Q function. This first part here is a standard target, but then there will be an additional entropy term here that naturally pops up as we saw in the first lecture when you look at maximum entropy reinforcement learning, we have a reward in the objective plus beta times entropy. Here beta is one, that's why there is uh, uh, no, no factor in front. Your Q targets are now adjusted to be also account for the max ent, then updating the policy through information projection, meaning when you again do the thing like we saw in DDBG, optimize your policy to maximize your Q value, you have to account for the fact that you actually now want max end policy that optimizes Q value, which we know means a policy that is effectively the exponentiated Q values. And so it's done by saying, we're gonna minimize the KL divergence between the policy and the exponentiated Q values encoded policy on our samples and repeat until convergence. In soft actor critic, of course, these things are not exactly optimized as an iterative optimization We'll take one gradient step or a couple of gradient steps here. Again, here on this Cal objective, just a few gradient steps. And then of course we, we keep repeating. So what does this look like as a whole? Our objective is now the max end objective. So if you wanna keep track, how well is my agent doing? You don't wanna just plot reward if, if you wanna know what your optimization is succeeding, though you might care about reward mostly. If you wanna know what your optimization is doing, what it's expected to be doing, you wanna plot rewards plus uh, entropy, and then iterate. The value function estimate is this thing here. The value target is based on Q and entropy is introducing the entropy here through the value function neural network. Then the new Q target is reward plus expected value at the next time. And then the policy is based on the KL to the policy defined by exponentiated Q values. Okay. Once you do this, here are some learning curves for humanoid, one of the harder simulated control problems. And we see soft actor critic doing really well. DDPG is here. What does that mean? It probably means that either its exploration wasn't very good or when it had some good exploration, it wasn't able to extract the signal from it. With more tweaking, probably you can make this do better. But the beauty here, when you read a soft actor critic paper, which actually I'm one of the authors of, is that 
it's not so sensitive to the hyperparameter settings and it consistently tends to work quite well. Even across multiple runs, you can often see that even the worst run does very well, which is a really nice property. Then here are a few other environments. Again, in yellow, soft actor critic consistently having really strong learning curves uh, compared to the other methods. And that's also why it has become very often a method of choice. Here's the video. So Hopper learns to hop really well. Walker learns to run. Cheetah runs off the grid. Um, and runs off the grid. Humanoid learns to like walk in some interesting ways. Um, so what we see here is that all these canonical environments, soft data critic can do really well on. Um, it's even been used to train some real robots and has robust performance there. Um, manipulation robots. And block, Lego block stacking. So um, it's a very efficient, robust learning method, and that's why it's been um, amenable to running on real robots, where, of course, data collection tends to be somewhat expensive, and you, you want to um, be fairly uh, data efficient to make it practical. Okay, so this was one of our short, shorter lectures. We covered two of the most common methods in RL today, um, DDPG and Soft Active Critic. Um, they compute policies ultimately, but at the same time are learning a Q function and the policy gets extracted from that Q function. Um, and that's in some sense what would characterize the actor critic method. They're both actor critic methods where the policy gets extracted fairly directly from uh, this Q function that's being learned.